This is episode 19 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash sajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute to tell a friend. If you've done that, please consider giving the podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This episode contains a little bit more fleeting explicit language. Chapter 44. Damn, damn. Fall 2010 to summer 2011. They sat on their blanket rolls around the crackling fire under a clear, starry night. Note. Apologies to the memory of Edward Abbey and the Monkey Ranch Gang, 1975. Resources for this section include Daily Mail, 2009, Fronseca, 2015, Moonpage.com, 2018, Waterdata.com, 2018, and the Wikipedia pages for Glen Canyon Dam and Flaming Gorge Dam. End of note. Eva, Gus, John, and Pops were sipping whiskey and water. In the fall of 2010, Eva had been hiking across the American Southwest when she met these three out in the backcountry. They were inching along a two-track in a jeep when she topped the hill above them. She had yelled at them about making too much of a racket, and they had asked if she wanted a ride. Illuminated by a setting sun, wearing jean shorts and a tank top, she was sure they got an eyeful. It was hot, it had been a long day, and she was low on water, so she got in. Over the next few months, she traveled the area with them, destroying infrastructure projects that encroached on the wilderness. They pulled up survey stakes hobbled bulldozers by draining their oil pans, and generally making a nuisance of themselves. They photographed illegal dumping and leaked the images to the media. Ava had suggested that they sew replica arrowheads, broken pottery, and old glass from an antique store along the new pipeline right away. She had friends who were archaeologists and knew that finding these things would slow down the survey and make plenty of work for them. Everything they did, though, was small potatoes. One by one, each of the men tried to insinuate themselves with their new traveling companion. Gus was straightforward and propositioned her outright. But she told him that asking a woman, so, do you want to fuck or what, was not likely to work. Gus shrugged and told her it worked more often than she'd guess. John was overly friendly and tried to sit a little too close to her whenever he had a chance. But Pop asked him how his wives were doing. John had asked her sheepishly what she thought about polygamy, and she had asked him if he could even keep one woman satisfied. The guffaws of the other two made her think she had played it right. Pops was the last to approach her, but he was old enough to be her father and she told him so. He got misty-eyed and said that his last wife had liked that about him, before sharing a meaningful look with Gus. In their travels, they crossed the Highway 89 bridge next to the Glen Canyon Dam a dozen times. They never spoke when crossing the steel arched over the remnants of the Colorado River. Instead, everybody stared at the big block of concrete spanning the canyon, each trying to figure out a realistic way to bring it down. That winter, sitting around the campfire, Eva thought she had the answer. I really hate that dam, she said. Which? Glen Canyon? asked Pops. He was a wiry older man with a bald pate, large nose, and thick glasses. Yeah, of course, she said. Eh, they all need to come down, grunted Gus from beneath his thick, disheveled mop of black hair. Although short, he was built like the proverbial brick shithouse. I've got an idea, she said. We've all been thinking about that dam since before you were born, said John. For a while, we thought about just buying a houseboat, stuffing it with fertilizer, and kablooey! John yelled, spreading his hands over his head. It's too thick, and that won't work. Plus, what about the thousands of people living downstream? They won't have time to evacuate. John was lanky, sporting a plaid shirt, jeans, and unkempt blonde hair like a haystack on his head. He looked like he was covered in a thin film of dust, which is not entirely inaccurate. Yeah, said Ava. It's too thick. Even at the top, it's 25 feet of reinforced concrete. At the bottom, you'd have all the pressure of the water to help, but it's 300 feet thick there, so that's just too much to blow. The amount of explosive we'd need would be bigger than your boat. Let's see, that'd be hmm, a breaching radius of, say, 50 feet cubed, times a material factor for reinforced concrete of about one-half, times a tamping factor of one if it was suspended underwater next to the dam, divided by um, about 2,000 pounds, means about, I don't know, 32 tons of TNT? The men looked at her with their mouths open. I never met a lady who knew explosives tables, said Gus, blushing. Pops continued ignoring Gus. On top of that, the dam hasn't been full in years, and that'd be the best time to strike. The only way is to use the maximum water pressure to help push the dam over. But again, too many people would die. What if I had a way to get them out of the way, fill the reservoir, and cause the dam to burst, she asked. The three men just stared at her for a minute. Well, shit, why didn't you say so, asked Gus. Spill it. Eva paused, unsure if Gus knew what a pun was before continuing. The dam is obviously too thick to blow up, but the two spillways have pretty flimsy gates that have easy access to below the waterline. 
Right, but the level of Lake Powell has to get to about 3650 before it even reaches the spillway gate, said Pops. And then it's another 60 feet of elevation before it reaches the reservoir maximum. And they don't even get much past 3600 feet anymore. That's about 17 million acre feet of water short, so blow all the doors you want, but that won't do anything. Well, if you're going to be such a pessimist about it, said Eva, I won't tell you how to get around that. Oh, stop being coy. Okay, fine. We'd have to take advantage of the spring melt. Lake Powell's nadir is in April, and it maxes out at the end of June. Usually they open up the river outlets and run the turbines pretty high to discharge about 15,000 cubic feet each second. We'll have to screw up some of the inlets, maybe by dropping some line down through the intakes, or something else to come up the works. That should get us a few million acre feet. Even then, we might not get up high enough, so we could get three to four million more acre feet by blowing the Flaming Gorge Dam. You don't think they'll put extra security on Glen Canyon after we do that? asked John. Of course they would, but we'd make that attack simultaneously. Then the water will overwhelm the spillway and vibrate the dam down, like the near collapse in 83, but stronger. But they fixed the spillways. The problem back then was cavitation. You know, when water running down the tubes is at such a high pressure it creates bubbles that collapse and cause shock waves. I know the whole spillway is poorly designed with its big downhill slope and water picking up speed as it drops 500 feet, then batters against the curve in the tunnel that brings it out horizontal. Once it starts to make a washboard on the bottom surface, the water crashed into the floor of the tunnel with even more force. It dug out the concrete tunnel lining and boulders of sandstone bedrock. But the problem is, they ended up putting in vents that prevent cavitation. Back in 83, they only had the spillways open about 7% of the way. And after they installed the vents, they've been able to let five times that amount of water through without any damage to the tunnels. Right, said Eva. So the plan would be to destroy the vents and then open the gates to full flow. If I remember right... The most they've had it open is 50,000 cubic feet per second, but the total capacity is almost three times that in each spillway. The vents are about 250 feet down the tunnel. We could drop dynamite on the end of a rope, blow a hole in the lining just above the vent, and then another charge at the elbow. Then the water would dig the whole thing out. Back in 83, the dam was almost lost. The sandstone bedrock is not that stable and leaks already. If we can get it vibrating again, I think it stands a good chance of coming down. At full flow of a quarter million cubic feet per second, it would take about a week for four million acre feet to be drawn off the lake. If a week of shaking can't bring that dam down, nothing will. Ah, said Pops, now I see how people can get out of the way. It would take a little while for the water to eat through the tunnel and undermine the sides of the dam. It would probably stay up for a day or two, half a day at least, which is plenty of time for an emergency evacuation. Eva smiled. Exactly. And since everybody's off on the 4th of July anyway, and it's a long weekend, why not blow them that weekend? Folks will be more likely to go out of town since they aren't working and schools are closed. You're forgetting one thing, said Gus. How are we supposed to blow all this stuff? We can't just walk up to the gates and knock. No, you're right. They won't let us in, but security is surprisingly lax. Each intake gate is only about 150 feet from the nearest perimeter fence, and that's just a chain link. In the middle of the night, we can cut or hop the fence, sprint the distance, drop the charges, blow them before security can get there. Even if they have motion sensors or something, we'd only need about 30 seconds to get it done. If we're lucky, we'd get a few minutes and be able to guarantee our work. It'd be great if we could get back out of the fence and get away, but it'd be worth it even if we got caught. Do you want to try and get lead in? asked Gus. We've got the hard hats, safety vests, and clipboards that might make us look legitimate. Sure, why not, she said. If they let us in for some sort of survey, we could blow it in broad daylight. Maybe we could try and get in it a few days before, spend the day, you know, surveying, and then come back at night to get it done. I think the floodgates are metal, said John. We could use big dang magnets on the bundles of dynamite and just lower them down towards the supports. That could work, said Eva. Or better yet, we could belay someone down on a line who can put the charges between the gate and the trusses and another charge on the hinges. If we can get to dismantle the door, the water will wash it down and out. Plus, we have to drop the 250-foot line down the tunnel anyway. Plus more charges for the elbow. Hmm, said Pops. I like this. It could work. Should we do some exploring? Gus, John? Both nodded in agreement and laid back on their bedrolls to stare at the sky. A few months later, a houseboat puttered up to the east side of the chain safety buoys a quarter mile upstream of the Glen Canyon Dam. The boat had been borrowed from a marina about four miles upstream of the dam. It was nighttime on June 1, 2011. The new moon was a black disk in the starry sky. The only illumination was the high-pressure sodium floodlights on the dam. The boat's red and green navigation lights had been disconnected, and its dark bulk was nearly invisible as it turned its stern towards the dam. Inside the boat, 
where coils of rope, cables, and chain wound around eight drums. Lake Powell contained about 14 million acre-feet of water, making its elevation 3,623 feet, 25 feet and 3 million acre-feet below the base of the floodgates. Ava, Gus, Pops, and John rolled a drum to the rear of the boat, where they had mounted a rack to hold the spool and pay its load over the stern. First, the end of a rope was fed through a pulley, attached to a 20-pound mushroom anchor, which was dropped over the edge. The other end of the line was secured to a cleat on the stern. The line was a red Supertech rope, designed for crab traps. It had neutral buoyancy, meaning it neither floated nor sank. The spool revolved slowly at first, and then sped up as the anchor descended. The anchor dropped about 400 feet until it hit the bottom, but before the drum could stop rotating, Eva had pulled the lever, moving the winch motor into place on the rim of the spool. Pops attached the alligator clips to the boat's batteries, and the motor whined. Another 1,200 feet of line spooled into the water. After about half of the line was out, they saw that it began to drift south, towards the dam. Eva freed the end of the line from the cleat, and it pulled free of her hands with noticeable force, slipping into the water, down to the anchor, and free of the pulley. The line's being pulled in, said Gus. Well, pulled towards the penstocks, at least, said Eva. I think we'll know when it gets sucked into the intake. I hope the drum is off the boat by then. After 2,000 feet of line, 400 feet of half-inch cable had been spliced into the end. Another 200 feet of chain was linked to the end of the cable. The noise of the winch engine changed from a chug to a whine, and John trying to tug the rope with a gloved hand. I can't hold it back. It's pulling itself now. Well, the dam's 1,300 feet away, said Pops, and that's 2,000 feet of line, so it should be near the penstocks, if not in the feeder pipe. They're running at almost 23,000 cubic feet of water a second through the dam at this time of year. Let's drop the spool. Everybody nodded as Eva pulled the lever with bombs away, scrawled on the handle. The spool rolled down the rack and splashed into the water. They held their breath as it bobbed back to the surface, buoyed by the canister of air inside the drum on the spool. The spool rotated in place as the cable slipped off and down into the water. It's moving. Get the rest going, said John, mounting to the controls. He pulled the boat 100 feet to the west, and the process started all over again. The next spool was rolled onto the rack, the anchor dropped, and the line fed out. The drum was then rolled off into the water as soon as the rope began to pick up its own slack. Another five drums were dropped at 100-foot intervals, moving west along the safety buoy barrier. As they were dropping their eighth drum, they heard splashing near the first spool. Even in the darkness, they could see the drum being drugged towards the dam across the surface. As it approached the dam, the spool disappeared below the water's surface. The end of the chain had been secured around the drum to drag it down and tension the cable. You're going to need a bigger boat, said Gus in his best Jaws impression. A few minutes earlier, the last line had almost reached the turbine as it snaked its way from the open water of the reservoir through the penstock intakes, passing easily through the foot-wide openings of the grate about 200 feet below the surface. As the rope reached the 254,000 horsepower Francis turbine, it began winding around the shaft at 150 rotations per minute. The rope was quickly shredded, but it kept coming, pulling the rest of the load into the turbine. After about a minute, 2,000 feet of line had been disintegrated or wound around the four-foot-high shaft, pulling the cable into the courses. The Francis turbine resembled a jet engine with blades rotating around a central shaft. Water was fed into the turbine through a spiraling tube similar to a snail shell. Just before spinning the turbines, the water passed through guide vanes, giving it the perfect angle to push the blades efficiently. The leading edge of the blades, the weakest point of the turbine, shredded the rope, but had trouble with the cable now passing through it. Deep gouges were cut into the edges as the cable was pulled across them. By the time the trailing chains reached the blades, they were jagged. Within a few seconds, one blade was shredded enough to catch in the surrounding guide vanes, ripping the internal channels apart. The turbine speed slowed as the end of the chain passed through. The metal-on-metal metal screech became louder. Even on the reservoir, 500 feet above and a quarter mile upstream, Eva, Gus, John, and Pops heard the sound bouncing off the canyon walls. It sounds like the world's largest spoon stuck in the world's largest garbage disposal, said John. Eva hit the bombs away lever on the eighth spool. We need to go. Now. Headline. Catastrophe at Glen Canyon Dam Generating Station. No danger to the public. June 3, 2011. Page, Arizona, Wired News Agency. In the early morning hours yesterday, the Glen Canyon Dam's power generating plant suffered catastrophic failure. Details are still emerging, but the entire station has been shut down as officials inspect the damage. One source reports that at least five of the eight turbines have been rendered inoperable. No injuries are reported, and unlike the 1983 emergency, when high water levels forced the dam's spillways into operation, causing violent erosion and nearly destroying the dam, plant operators stress that this incident poses no threat to the public other than potential instability in the electric grid. Headline. 
Freak Coincidence of Marina Debris at Fault in Glen Canyon Dam Disaster, June 6, 2011. Page, Arizona, Wired News Agency. Officials at the Glen Canyon Dam have confirmed that six of the eight energy-generating turbines have been damaged beyond repair, and the power plant will be shut down for at least a year while repairs are undertaken. According to James Dugan, Regional Commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation, at a press conference yesterday, at 1.43 a.m. Mountain Standard Time on June 2nd, a quote-unquote freak coincidence occurred when debris passed through the penstock gates and proceeded through the water intake tunnels to the turbines, which experienced catastrophic damage as the rotating blades met the obstructions. Initial indications that our ropes, cables, and chains slipped through the grate that was meant to keep larger items out of the system. When pressed, Mr. Dugan speculated that the debris originated in one of the many marinas on Lake Powell, as the rope was a special order marine type and cable and chains are also common in these operations. Construction on the Glen Canyon Dam on the Arizona-Utah border began in 1956 and opened a decade later at a cost of $1.87 billion in today's dollars. It is owned and operated by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. This concrete arch dam holds back Lake Powell, a reservoir along the Colorado River. It is over 700 feet tall and a popular tourist attraction, hosting daily tours, which have been suspended since the accident. The eight Francis turbines are capable of generating 1,320 megawatts of electricity for the region. The loss of the 4.7 gigawatt hours produced by the dam annually will cause problems with the regional electrical infrastructure. Although the regional coal, natural gas, and nuclear power stations have the capability to fill this gap, hydroelectric power was used for the fluctuating demands of users. The other generators provide a steady stream of power, but the dam's output could be changed quickly by releasing more or less water through the turbines. The dam is also a keystone of the Southwestern Water Management System, controlling the release of water for the region's agriculture and protecting downstream infrastructure from annual flooding. The dam was nearly destroyed in 1983 when record floods forced the operators to open the spillway. As 32,000 cubic feet of water passed through these emergency channels each second, small air bubbles formed and collapsed along the walls, a phenomenon known as cavitation. These small shocks ate through the spillway walls and the water eroded the sandstone bedrock, causing the dam to shake and large boulders to be dislodged. Enough water was released to allow the spillway to be rebuilt with anti-cavitation measures. While foul play is not suspected, Mr. Dugan noted that investigators are treating it as suspicious and anyone with information on the accident should come forward immediately. The dam incited controversy as soon as it was proposed, with environmental groups such as the Sierra Club opposing the flooding of 110 miles of the canyon. In more recent decades, the ecological impact of the dam has been blamed for the reduction of fish and plant life in the lower Colorado River system. In 1981, a group of radical environmentalists unrolled a large plastic sheet cut to look like a crack down the face of the dam to protest its existence. At this time, the two through outlets are releasing 8,000 cubic feet of water per second to keep the Colorado River flowing at a minimum level. Mr. Dugan stressed the dam itself suffered no damage from this accident, no workers were injured, and the public is safe. Headline, Administrators Discuss Next Moves in Repairing Glen Canyon Dam. June 19, 2011. Page, Arizona. Wired News Agency. U.S. Bureau of Reclamation officials, local stakeholders, and others met behind closed doors to discuss how to deal with the temporary shutdown of the Glen Canyon Dam due to the accident on June 2nd. That morning, Marina Debris entered the dam's intakes and shredded six turbines, and the power plant has been shut down since that time. Usually the turbines take years to fabricate and install, but the plant was in the process of replacing the turbines when this disaster occurred. Since 2004, new turbines manufactured in Brazil under a $40 million contract have been replacing the previous 1990-era models. Four new turbines were already in place, two of which were significantly damaged by debris. The remaining four damaged turbines were slated to be replaced by 2015. It is unclear if production can be expedited, but officials are hoping to have at least four turbines generating power within one year. Of more immediate concern is what is to be done with the water entering Lake Powell. This accident has come at the worst time of year, said Bureau Commissioner James Dugan. At the beginning of the month, the reservoir stood at 3,623 feet, 77 feet short of full pool. Another 14 million acre feet of water can enter Lake Powell, but Mr. Dugan says that the emergency spillways would be open before that happens. May, June, and July have the highest monthly inflow of water, averaging between one half and one acre foot of water per second. This year, however, has higher flow than usual, and June has seen inflows between one and a half and two acre feet per second. Usually this would be used to generate extra electricity, but with the plant down, the outflow has been restricted to the federally mandated minimum one-fifth of an acre foot per second by way of the two undamaged through outlets. The reservoir has risen three million acre feet since the accident, and at this rate the reservoir will be full sometime in mid-August. 
Officials and local stakeholders are currently debating whether or not to release more water from the reservoir. Agriculture depends on irrigating from the Colorado River, and by keeping the output at a minimum, it reduces the amount of available cropland that can be farmed. Representatives of the regional energy sector recommend building up a large volume of water in Lake Powell so that when the power plant is back online, it can run at high capacity while the nuclear, coal, and natural gas plants undergo maintenance. All local power stations have pushed back scheduled upkeep, avoiding partial energy generation shutdowns required for maintenance to make up for the loss of power from Glen Canyon. A strategy will be announced by the end of the month, at which point Lake Powell will contain about 20 million acre-feet and reach an elevation of 3,665 feet. Eva's paddle dipped rhythmically into Lake Powell as her kayak approached the line of buoys upstream of the dam. This is the highest I've seen it since 2001. John was guiding a river dory with pops and gusts. It's only a third of the way up the spillway door, said Gus. If we blow them both, we'll only get half the erosion in both. Maybe we should just do one. From the bottom of the door to where it is now represents about three million acre feet, said Pops. Those spillways can only take about four and a half acre feet for a second. They've never opened the gates all the way. After 83, they stress tested them at about one acre foot per second. That's twice as much as the water that caused the cavitation and nearly brought down the dam. Let's see. Four and a half acre feet per second at 60 per minute and another 60 per hour times 24 hours, we get almost 400,000 acre feet per day. So we'd have about a week's worth of water as it stands now. And don't forget about the Flaming Gorge, said Eva, about 3 million acre feet. How long does it take to get here? It's all the way up on the Wyoming border, asked Gus. It's hard to say exactly, said Pops. I still don't have all the variables. We know the approximate amount of water and how far away it is, but we don't know how steep and narrow the canyons are between here or there. What are we talking, asked John. A few hours and a wall of water comes rushing down? A week and it comes gradually? Eva drifted over and passed her paddle halfway onto the dory, rafting them all together. Well, judging from other dam failures, like the St. Francis Dam near L.A., where the flood did about 15 miles per hour, it could take a day. But if the water is trapped in canyons, like a lot of the upper Colorado, it could move like a Johnstown flood about 40 miles per hour, getting to Glen Canyon in about 8 hours. Either way, another 3 million acre feet come rushing in. If the spillway hadn't failed yet, that should do it. Eva, Gus, John, and Pops piled into the jeep, all dressed in dark earth toned clothing. Eva and Gus wore climbing harnesses. They were headed north on Highway 89. To the right, they passed Page, the small town that sprang up during the dam's construction. Gus feared left at a sign for the Glen Canyon Dam Scenic Overlook. He followed Scenic View Road as it curved to the right, past the National Parks Office and townhomes. He switched off the lights and coasted as he turned to the left into the scenic lookout parking lot. John jumped out of the passenger seat and sprinted into the darkness. He headed towards the dam, flicking on his headlamp once as he was away from the parking lot. He didn't want to stumble over the edge and fall 700 feet into the river. He found a scrub bush a dozen yards off the path with a good view of the dam. Stooping down, he mounted a small camera to the trunk of the bush and snipped branches out of the way of the lens. He hit the power button and looked to confirm that the dam was in frame. He hit the shutter button and heard the click as the first image was taken. The camera was set to take a picture every minute and had enough battery and memory to run for days. He stepped back and looked to see that the camera was well hidden before hurrying back to the jeep, which Gus had turned around. They set off again, heading back onto Highway 89, following it for a half a mile before veering to the right onto a gravel road. With the headlights off again and not touching the brakes, the jeep coasted to a stop in front of a closed gate. John and Eva hopped out, sheared the lock holding the gate with the bolt cutters, and swung it open. After the jeep passed through, they locked it again with a new padlock. Eva opened a box she had been carrying with her and scattered dozens of caltrops, rebar segments with sharpened ends bent at right angles and welded together so that one sharp end always pointed up across the roadway before getting back in. The jeep puttered past signs for the Hanging Gardens trail as they turned left. Gus gunned the engine and then turned it off, popping the shifter into neutral and coasting down the final half mile until they got within 200 feet of the emergency spillway. He stopped the jeep by swinging it around to face the other way on the road. I'm leaving the keys in the ignition. Whoever gets here first should start it up. The others nodded and wordlessly got down out of the jeep, pulling masks down over their faces. Eva checked that they were all covered and then clicked on the GoPro camera on her radio chest harness. She handed out backpacks and parcels from the rear. Everyone hustled off into the dark night. They had picked the date because it was another new moon, Friday, July 1st, 2011. A hundred feet from the road, they hit the six-foot chain-link fence topped with barbed wire. Gus unrolled a large rubberized mat and flung it over the top before putting his back to the fence post and interlacing his fingers. John was first over, stepping onto Gus's hands and pivoting over the fence. Eva followed, and Pops was next. They all turned to see Gus take a run at the fence, catching the top under his armpits and snagging his leg as he swung over. Shit, was all he said, 
assessing the tear in his pants and superficial cut. Eva knelt to bind it up, and Gus tried to stop her. Oh, I don't care that you're bleeding, she said, her teeth white in the dark as she grinned. I just don't want them to follow a blood trail, you big oaf. Gus grunted in assent, and they continued around to the left, onto the access road, looping around to the top of the spillway housing. Gus and Ava quickly tied climbing ropes onto the protruding control mechanisms and started to rappel back over the edge into the gate struts below, one in each spillway. They each carried a bag clipped to their harness, and they made quick work of emptying them of their payload. Explosive charges strapped to cell phones and strong magnets. They double-checked that each phone was on and connected a pair of wires with a twist-on connector. They put one on each of the primary horizontal struts holding the gates against the rising water. Gus and Eva both whistled three times as they finished and started descending down 100 feet to the spillway surface. John and Pops had been waiting and lowered down loads to each of them. Each held two bundles of rope, 250 feet long, and what looked like boxes of printer paper with wheels. Two flat carts with pairs of 12-inch wheels on either side and eye hooks on front and back. On top of the boxes were watches, one set with 15 minutes and the other with 10. Eva and Gus quickly tied one end of the line to the front of the 10-minute cart and the other end to the back of the 15-minute cart. Then the second line was attached to the front of the 15-minute cart before being tied into the gate strut. They double-checked the timers and connected a pair of wires on each box. Ready, said Eva. Ready, said Gus. Five, four, three, two, one, go, they heard from above. At one, they hit the start button on each timer. Then they pushed the first cart down the spillway, paying out line as it descended. As the first cart reached the end of its rope, the second cart followed it down. When all the line had been let out, both boxes, full of explosives, were suspended at key points in the tunnel. The 10-minute cart was just above the sharp curve at the bottom of the spillway, and the 15-minute cart was suspended a few feet above the cavitation-reducing channels. Six minutes, said Pops. Let's get out of here. John and Pops worked together pulling up Eva's line, and then all three hauled up Gus. Three minutes, Pops, panting, was looking at his watch. Jesus, this is going to be close. They hurried to finish stuffing the line and any other equipment into their packs. They were halfway up the road, out of the spillway, when the first pair of explosions went off. Even deep in the tunnels, it was louder than they had expected, and they felt a slight tremor. Just then, a security vehicle crested the road ahead of them. Only its headlights were visible as it wound down the service road. The four flattened themselves against the inside of the curve, where the lights wouldn't hit them. They could see the security guard as he passed. Apparently, he hadn't heard the blast because he looked bored and tired. Just past them, the security vehicle stopped and its engine turned off. Apparently, he was going to sit at the fork in the road between the dam and the spillway to look out over the lake. Behind her, Eva could hear Pops wheezing, muttering to himself. Oh, that feels funny, he was saying. What should we do? Eva said, whispering. Let's slowly inch up this road and get out of here, said Gus. I, said Pops, I, I don't feel right. My arm's tingling. I think I'm having a heart attack. No, 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 not now, said John. Come on, Pops, you're fine. We can wait here, said Eva. I know what this is, said Pops. I won't make it over the fence and I'll slow you down. He pulled off his mask, followed by his shirt. What are you doing, old man? asked Gus. A distraction, said Pops, wheezing as he undid his pants and slipped out of them, now standing naked except for his shoes. Nobody wants to tackle the naked guy. Go, he said, and started running towards the parked security vehicle. John, Eva, and Gus looked on dumbstruck as Pops ran in front of the truck's lights and started dancing. As the security guard jumped out of his seat, Pops took off running down the road towards the dam. Let's go, said John, and started up the road back towards the jeep, followed by Gus. I'll be right behind you, said Eva, sprinting down to the now empty security vehicle. The guard had left the door open, and she dove in, pulled it out of gear, and released the parking brake. She straightened the wheel and got out as the truck started to roll forward. Eva turned back to start up the road to follow John and Gus when she saw flashing lights, reflecting off of canyon walls. As the lights drew nearer, she could see John and Gus at the fence. Gus had just hit the ground on the other side and was lurching forward as John wormed over. She ran back down towards the spillway, looking back over her shoulder at the security truck rolling towards the edge. As the flashing lights came around the corner above her and the spillway, she could see more guards and personnel jumping and chasing John and Gus, who had just about made it to the jeep. Another security vehicle came down the road and reached the fork just as the truck hit the barrier, which slowed it but didn't stop it from rolling towards the cliff. Beyond, she could see Pops, now lying on the ground with a security guard on top of him. She took a step towards them when a second set of explosives went off. This time, all the guards heard it and would have looked in her direction if the truck hadn't gone over the edge just then. She ran to the guardrail, looked at the water of Lake Powell, about 40 feet below her, and jumped. Headline. Terrorists strike Glen Canyon and Flaming Gorge Dams. Catastrophic failure imminent. July 2nd, 2011. 
Page, Arizona, Wired News Agency. Last night, three individuals breached the security perimeter at Glen Canyon Dam and set off explosives in the emergency spillway, causing it to fail. Lake Powell, the reservoir of the dam, was at its highest elevation in years after damage to the turbines caused it to be shut down a month ago. The explosions appear to have damaged the spillway, and the water running down its tunnels will likely undermine the entire dam, says James Dugan, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation Regional Commissioner. The crisis intensified when Flaming Gorge Dam, about 360 miles upstream of Glen Canyon Dam, also failed last night due to a yet unexplained explosion. It is estimated that 2 to 3 million acre-feet of water will reach Lake Powell by tomorrow, further stressing the damaged spillways. Although officials have not confirmed that these events are linked at the time the story went to press, it seems likely that they are part of a coordinated attack. Three individuals were arrested fleeing the dam at the time of the explosion, one of whom has died in custody. Officials have not yet released the names of those detained, but they have put out this tentative timeline of events. At approximately 11.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on July 1st, the first of a series of explosions went off in the spillway of the Glen Canyon Dam. Just after this first blast, a security guard on his usual rounds was accosted by one of the individuals. He called for backup, which arrived as the second set of blasts went off at 11.35 p.m. These first two explosions appear to have happened within the tunnels and were felt only as a low rumble by security personnel on the surface. Two individuals were apprehended as they attempted to flee the scene, and another was detained on the road on top of the dam. At 11.48 p.m., a final series of blasts destroyed the floodgates, opening the spillways. One minute later, the Flaming Gorge Dam suffered a series of explosions, causing it to fail. It is unclear at this moment whether or not the Glen Canyon Dam can survive this attack. Downstream residents have been asked to evacuate their homes, ruining many families' Fourth of July plans. In 1983, the spillways were opened during a record high spring flood, and design flaws in the tunnels caused violent vibrations that nearly destroyed the dam. Since then, new tunnel infrastructure was put in place and successfully tested, but the volume of water currently passing through the spillway is twice as much as the largest test volume. Furthermore, one dam official, speaking on the condition of anonymity, suspects that the initial blasts were targeted to weaken the tunnels, making a catastrophic failure more likely. Headline, Fourth Terrorists Sought in Connection to Failure of Glen Canyon and Flaming Gorge Dams. July 5th, 2011. Page, Arizona, Wired News Agency. Late on July 1st, four individuals used explosives to open the spillway of Glen Canyon Dam and destroy the Flaming Gorge Dam. Three individuals were arrested as they attempted to flee the scene. One day later, on the morning of July 3rd, Glen Canyon Dam failed as the water released from the Flaming Gorge Dam reached Lake Powell. The spillways were overwhelmed by the uncontrolled influx of water, and vibration shook the dam until cracks appeared on the eastern edge adjacent to the spillways. Within minutes, the dam failed, sending over 10 million acre-feet of water downstream, causing billions of dollars of damage. Luckily enough, warning was given, and miraculously only one fatality has been reported, and that individual, whose name has not yet been released, was reportedly trying to shoot the flood in a kayak. Until yesterday, it was thought that all the individuals responsible for this attack were apprehended on the scene, but a recent video has made it clear that a fourth individual was involved and remains at large. A video posted to a YouTube account on July 4th appears to be filmed by one of the attackers using a wearable camera. The night vision video is not high quality, but it clearly shows a group of four individuals first scaling a fence and placing explosives in the tunnel and along the floodgate's support struts. The reason that this individual was not apprehended is made clear in the video, as she escaped by jumping into Lake Powell and swimming to a nearby beach, at which point she used a cell phone to set off the charges in the spillway. All of those arrested are shown in the video except this fourth person, who is wearing the camera, and is thought to be a woman because of her voice. The video gives a more complete account of the events of July 1st than authorities had released and has been viewed over a million times on its first day. The video shows the attackers scaling a fence, running to the dam spillway gate and rappelling down into the gate supports, where they installed explosive links to cellular phones. Next, they lowered what appeared to be explosive on carts down into the spillway shafts, suspended by ropes and activated by stopwatches. The attackers attempted to flee the scene, but a security guard on his rounds forced them to hide, at which time it appears one of the attackers, likely the one who died in police custody, their names have not yet been released, appears to suffer a heart attack. To give his confederates a chance to escape, he stripped naked and distracted the security guard by first dancing in front of his vehicle and then running away. The reason why the fourth attacker escaped arrest is then explained. As two began to run towards their getaway vehicle, she went to the security vehicle, released its brakes, ran away, and jumped into Lake Powell at the same time as the vehicle crashed through a barrier and fell into the lake. The video then shows her swimming approximately 300 feet to a public access beach, at which point she apparently uses a cell phone to text the phones connected to the explosives, as shortly after she sends the first texts, loud explosions are heard. She then texts another message, and although no explosions are heard, it is thought that these activated explosives on the Flaming Gorge Dam 360 miles to the north. 
The video cuts to a dramatic time lapse of the video of the dam failing, shot from a site overlooking the dam. The video ends back on the beach, and the forest attacker's voice is clearly heard to say, Free the rivers, expletive the industrial rape of the wild. Authorities have not commented on this video, nor the fourth suspect, but its authenticity has been confirmed in comments from former employees of the Glen Canyon Dam. End of chapter. End of episode 19 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.